Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I'm your host, Chris Brown, and I'm pleased and honored to have our guest in today. She is going to be on her book launch tour here in Calgary on January, or Jill, just January, July 7th at the Petroleum Club. Uh, tickets are still available. They'll be in the show notes, notes a little bit later. Um, but Tasha Carradon, the author of The Right Path, How Conservatives Can Unite, Inspire, and Take Canada Forward. Tasha, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure. Oh, well, it's a pleasure to be here too. Thank you so much. So, Tasha, I, I usually start off my all my interviews with the same generic question, and you're no exception. But what does politics mean to you? That is a deep question. <laughs> um, it's uh, no, it's it's great. I no one's ever asked me that before. To be honest with you, um, they've asked me why you're conservative, that kind of thing, why your type of politics. But politics itself, to me, is it's about people and it's about, it's the most fundamental thing because it, it um, governs all our relationships with each other. And we govern those at different levels, you know, the family, the community, the church, whatever, you know, groups it's immediately around you. But politics is kind of a super layer over everything. And if you mess it up, it can trickle down and damage those smaller institutions. So to me, it's very important that politics that we get our politics right and that involves a lot of things ensuring that um it's uh you know it is fair it permits people to have their say that we have democracy preserved um and uh so to me it's it is in that sense it's a calling it's more like it's it's not really uh work or it, it's a vocation i guess something that i think is just really and that's why I, i've been interested in it since i'm a teenager so what brought you to politics? Because I, I remember what brought me into politics, and that was the 1990 Ontario election, because my aunt was running for the Ontario Liberals at the time. So that's what I got. That was my introduction to politics. So what was your introduction to politics? I had a few. Um, <laughs> I remember when Margaret Thatcher was elected, and she I was I think I was eight or nine. And I was so excited that a woman was prime minister. Um, my family always talked about we always talked about politics. We watched the news as it was in the olden days you had the news on the tv at dinner right yeah and so we would sometimes do that or we'd talk about it so i was very politically aware um at an early age and so i was very excited about this so she's my first and she was a conservative of course so i think that's that started me on you know with looking at conservatism and then um when i was 14 years old a colleague of my father's asked him to get involved in the local conservative or progressive conservative campaign. It was Brian Mulroney, 1984, you know, blue wave. And my father literally looked at him and said, I have no time, I am working, but Tasha is on vacation. She has nothing to do, which wasn't true. I think I had some kind of random summer job, but I went and I was completely hooked, honestly. Until then, I had really been veering more towards um, acting. I was very active in musical theater and dance and singing and all that stuff. Um, but I had also become interested in debating at school. So it was kind of already things were switching to, you know, from fiction to like actual paying attention to what's going on. And so I got into involved in this campaign. My local candidate was actually Jack Layton's dad, uh, Bob Layton. He was a conservative oh, though. Yep, yep, in Quebec. A fabulous, <laughs> yep, in Quebec in Lachine. He was a fabulous guy, really down to earth, very nice man. He was caucus chair and that was really his strength as people. And um, I, I fell in with a group of really well, you know, uh, well-minded young people too there. We formed a little crew, got involved in the executive after the election was over and we had won. I ended up working in his riding association wow. in the summertime the following year. Like it was all those things. And I think for me, I did a lot of reading too. I was, I was very interested, um, you know, in reading about current affairs and stuff, but the social piece was also extremely important. I was a huge nerd in school and uh, I found my tribe. I found, you know, the uh, the politically incorrect word we use now tribe right it's, yeah. but I found my my group my crew my people and I never looked back from them and got involved in the party for I was uh, 15 years I spent um, involved in the party before I depoliticized myself and went into media which uh, you seem like the same path that I took as well because I worked at Queens Park yeah. and then I depoliticized myself after an election and went to journalism and now I'm back in the political realm but more on interviewing whoever wants to come on the show because I love chatting with people but talking about reading uh your new book the right path and yes. I want to I want to read off the entire name because I I don't want to do disservice to you but the right path how conservatives can unite inspire and take Canada forward I guess the, the the million dollar question is why now? Why why come out with this book now? Well, the book was supposed to originally come out in November, 
Um, I had started writing it immediately after the last election, um, the, the third conservative loss. And I had written a book uh, in 2005, Rescuing Canada's Right, with a good friend of mine, Adam DeFalla. At the time, the party had been out of power for 13 years. And so we had a bunch of prescriptions for it to come back, uh, which it did then. And um, I had meant to write a sequel for a while, but things, you know, we were in power. The conservatives were in power. I mean, there was no need to really give any advice at that point. But then I, I, I felt after the last election, I had something to say. I was looking at this and going, you know what? Someone's got to say something. This cannot continue. And I, I guess I hadn't been partisan in a long time, but I felt that sort of itch of like, you know, they really, I just feel like I can't go on. I can't sit back and watch this. I was literally saying that to friends of mine. We can't just sit here and do nothing. So I, I started hashing out a book and I started talking to different people, interviewing people. I, my book agent, you know, we got a book deal just before Christmas. Things were moving along at a sort of normal pace and I anticipated taking a year to write the book and there we go. And then all of a sudden <laughs> leadership happened in February. And that was for me personally, a very, um, interesting time because people asked me if I would run for leader, which was not expected. Um, and I still wanted to write the book. And so I ended up in the last four months, it's been a complete whirlwind of thinking of running for leader, uh, deciding to support John Shree, working on the campaign on as co-chair and um, writing the book at the same time. So what I feel though, the reason the book is coming out now is because um, I think that it's obviously a time when people are interested in the subject matter, clearly. Um, and I also think that the book itself is designed to make people think. Um, I think that the current race that we're in shows a clear division or polarity between different views of where the party should go. And the book is really about those views. It's not about the individuals. I do talk about you know, certain examples of things they have done or said as examples of these directions, but it's really about the twin arcs of populism and conservatism and how they have in Canadian history, they've intersected and how they're doing now and what's the way forward which direction should the party take can you reconcile them within one party um what's the direction for the party for canada so that's that's what's coming out now because well, let's be honest people have a, a decision to make and i think it can help them one way or the other uh, in that choice well you you mentioned the conservative movement across canada whether with the leadership race but uh, I'm going to look at it as a more of a global scale here and just play in the sandbox with me if you don't mind here, because yes. in Alberta, we're having a UCP a conservative leadership race as well for the premier of the uh, of Alberta uh, in the United Kingdom. You talk about Ma uh, Margaret Thatcher, but Boris Johnson has been under attack by the conservative movement, well, not the conservative movement, but people within his party. Is the right path going to address not just uh, federal issues but would it would it be equivalent to someone picking up in alberta and saying you know what we can take some of these messaging and use it towards what's happening here in alberta because we are seeing a divide in the ucp right now whether it be rural and urban whether it be suburban whether it be millennials and uh, the older generation can this be uh transposed to other leadership races as well at 100%, um, because like you said, it touches on sort of universal themes that conservatives are grappling with. I, 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 I quote, um, you know, conservatives from the US, from Canada, from the UK. I did, I read, I think about 30 books to write this book um, of different studies and things that have been done on how to get those voter groups engaged in conservative politics. And those lessons, as you said, the um, new Canadians, there are three groups I identify in the book that I say that the federal party has to get on side if it's going to, survive and thrive. Um, those apply to the local and uh, provincial levels as well. And that is new Canadians, urban slash suburban Canadians and Gen, uh, Gen Y and Z, millennials and Gen Z. Um, and I cite a lot of research into, you know, there's there's research dividing those into cohorts, for example, of young people. They're not just one monolith. It's, it's a myth that all of them have the same beliefs at all. There are certain groups that are very accessible to conservatives, um, others that are absolutely not. So you have to, understand that as you go forward. The other thing too is in the book, I talk I talk about Alberta quite a bit because social credit uh, was one of the populist parties, right? I talk about that, I talk about Diefenbaker, the fact that populism has always been incredibly important in the West. In fact, all the populist movements in Canada um, have originated in the West. Even the creditiste in Quebec were sort of a mirror of social credit. And we know that, you know, Bible Bill Eberhardt was premier for such a long time. And then the Mannings were, at, that influence is incredibly important. So, and you see that in the UCP. I don't talk about the UCP per se, but you do see that that continuity of thought um, 
and how people approach problems differently, even within the conservative family. So yes, I think there'd be a lot of, of interesting stuff for, uh, for folks in Alberta to read in the book. I, I want to talk about those three groups that you're going to mention in the book, and that is new Canadians, the uh, rural versus urban or suburban, uh, and millennials versus Gen Z. Um, we have seen in the last three elections under the Conservative Party, those uh, groups start move towards other parties. And in the last election, I think there was a little a big a bit a, a more of a divide within those groups. Um, I want to start with new Canadians because, uh, you know, and I know to win, you have to win more urban centers, Toronto, Montreal, and that's where traditionally more new Canadians settle. How can the Conservatives win over, without giving too much away, because I know you want people to buy the book and actually read it for themselves, but how can, how can Conservatives win over new Canadians when they're struggling to win over themselves right now during a leadership race? Well, um, we have a lot in we have a lot in common with new Canadians, but we have to get past the barrier that was put up in 2015. I'm talking federally now. Um, that was the uh, the NICAB snitch line, the NICAB ban, and then the barbaric pra cultural practices uh, tip line. Um, it's left a very sour taste in a lot of uh, new Canadians' mouths, and I've interviewed them extensively about how they feel about it. And it, it's an interesting thing. It's it's kind of a slippery slope argument. Their sense is, you know, I talked to one. Um, fellows in Patrick Brown's campaign, and he said, you know, it's the sense that uh, it, this kneecap ban made affect 200 people in the whole country. Was, I don't even know, I'm a Muslim, I, 200 women maybe in this entire country will wear a kneecap, like the full cup. He says, but he said, when the community hears that, what telegraphs to them is that first it's that, then it's telling you you can't worship at your place of worship, your mosque. Then it's saying to you, you know, you can't wear other things. Like it, 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 it's like a slippery slope argument. He said, and we've left places, many people where there was no um, you know, freedom of religion, where groups were persecuted or pitted against each other. We don't want that. All we want is opportunity for our kids. And that's actually in the book, this is a common thread for all the groups. It's to me, and this, this goes to the whole you know, populism versus conservatism. It's not about freedom. Freedom is a conservative concept, but it's got all sorts of other associations now. To me, it really is opportunity. That is a common thread because um, new Canadians want that opportunity. They want security. That's, you know, they want to be able to be entrepreneurs. They want to be able to start the businesses, have their kids succeed. And in fact, when you look at the numbers, it's fascinating. Um, children of newcomers go to university in a far excess of native born Canadians. It's a much higher percentage. Um, when you look at the, um, the percentage of people in the downtown, in Calgary actually, Calgary has one of the highest rates of downtown newcomers. Right. So when you hit the newcomer vote, you hit the urban vote, you hit the next generation, you hit all these people. Conservatism offers and I say there's a trifecta of faith, uh, family, free enterprise. Right. It's like this the saying of Russell Kirk in the United States that they sort of shorten it to. But it's true. Um, you know, conservatives, you go back in time to Edmund Burke, who was the first conservative in 1789 in the UK. And I read up on him and his attitude toward religion. He was a pluralist. He was very much a Christian in favor of, of, of religion, of Christian faith, and he, was, he didn't want discrimination against Catholics, against Protestants, but he also spoke, he says, you know what, he had great respect for Islam. He had great respect for other religions, and he wrote about this at a time when people were not. So conservatives actually are very open-minded when it comes to faith. We just respect the fact that people have one, right? And we have to telegraph that. So that's one thing. Family is another big thing. Um, the family is the little platoon of society, and Burke wrote about that too. Right, that is the core of society for conservatives is the family, which explains why we don't want the government interfering too much in what the family does because we, we disagree with that. And that goes to woke culture, it goes to a whole bunch of different places in the modern day that conservatives can say, hey, new Canadians, you want your kids to have good values, you want, there's a lot of stuff there too. So on those principles you can apply, plus then there's immigration itself, you know, I mean, if you go on an anti-immigrant route, you're never going to get the votes of new Canadians. So uh, that is a problem for conservatives. Not so much, I'd say conservatives, but you know, the People's Party has had some anti-immigrant messaging in the past couple of elections. So we don't want to be tarred with that. So there's a lot. There's a lot of material to work with, right? I'm going to ask a question. Then it may sound insensitive, but if you tune out, tune out of my show. That's what people do. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm if, just the button right now. I'm out, you know? Exactly. <laughs> 
most Canadians, and I say that as in uh, myself, as someone who was born in Canada, uh, from people, the first settlers of this uh, country, to uh, new Canadians, they want to see someone in their politicians. They want to see themselves in their politicians. And you talk about it in the book a little bit, and that's why this is where I'm sp- jumping off here a little bit, but I want to go back to the other two topics a little bit later. But you talk about an authenticity factor. They want someone who is real and they want someone who they can see themselves in. Um, that, in 2015, I think the biggest thing that happened in 2015 was... 10 years of Stephen Harper, they needed something fresh. So they saw Justin Trudeau as this, the Canadian version of Obama. So they saw an authenticity within Trudeau to deliver what he's talking about. We can talk for probably another hour on what he's actually done or not done, but (laughs) let's just continue on from there. Is authenticity something that conservatives have an issue with? Because we've seen the last two leaders some very troubling authenticity because they ran one way and then they ran general election another way. Does Do the conservatives need to find an actual authentic leader in 2022 to win the hearts and minds of not only new Canadians, but Canadians from coast to coast to coast? 100%. I think that is the biggest challenge um, is that it's trust, right? We didn't have trust in the last three elections. Canadians didn't trust. And Part of that was because um, the leaders who had run after Stephen Harper um, did not, they ran in one direction and then they ran another way when they were uh, running in the general election. Um, And Erin O'Toole is probably the biggest example of that is, you know, he was the true blue and then he took the party to the center um, and everyone got angry, like both sides of the the equations. So today, um, I think in this race, if there's anything, I think people are authentic. I'm trying, I'm looking at the candidates and do I, when I look at anyone, do I think there's anyone there who's not being themselves? No, I think people are being themselves. It's a question of what themselves will win the next election. What is what is the genuine article that Canadians will also buy for the direction they want to take the country? But I think that what we're seeing, I don't think anyone is, is saying one thing and going to do another. I wouldn't uh, of any of the candidates. So that is a good thing um, because I think that, you know, the, the challenge is when you're in front of the population and with the social media particularly, you can't hide, right? You cannot hide anything that you said or done and be something else. And people will see through it. And there's a, such a high level of cynicism. So no, authenticity is, is to me the most important currency a politician can have today. So on that note, I, I always find, I found it fascinating in the 2019 election that Justin Trudeau, which we all remember those famous blackface photos from when he was a teacher came out. And then A few days later, Andrew Scheer came out and he said he had a dual citizenship. And and I've said this on the show numerous times, and please just bear with me. My listeners know where I'm going. (laughs) Canadians took more offense to the fact that Andrew Scheer had dual citizenship than Justin Trudeau did blackface. And it comes down to this authenticity. Do Canadians hold conservative politicians and leaders in higher regards when it comes to that authenticity factor? Because we want a conservative who's true and we're okay with a liberal who's fake. (laughs) Well, I think it's more a question of moral relativism, right? Um, Liberals never really hold themselves out as moral paragons or paragons of virtue. That's really not what they do. They're they're, the woke uh, culture or the, I guess, um, sort of uh, when, when you're trying to get people to, I'm trying to think of the wrong words here. Sorry, I'm having a COVID moment. Um, when you're preaching to people about how they should behave, essentially, uh, you're trying to shame them into types of behavior. And we've seen that from Trudeau. It's like you demonize people um, and make them feel bad about themselves because they're not as good as you. They're not as as um, worthy as you. Know, as you you are, are a better person, quotes unquote, for, for the values you hold. Um, that is, is you know, no one expects liberals to be, I guess, um, to, yeah, to have that sort of moral center that conservatives often prescribe because, and this goes, I think it's also perhaps a religion thing too, because, you know, when you see a religious figure fall, you know, morally or morally fail, and you see that, it seems to be, oh my goodness, it's like such hypocrisy, right? Because that's what they're telling other people to do. In the case of Trudeau, he's just, you know, he's saying, he's shaming people into doing a certain type of of behavior, but it's kind of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And people, I think, gave him the benefit of the doubt for a very long time, in part because they liked him. Like this is, politics is also about the personal, right? And if you like someone, if you'd have a beer with them or a coffee, or you think they're handsome or whatever, 
there are lots of politicians who get away with a lot of stuff um, until they don't, you know, and until the shine wears off. Um, but in the case of Andrew Scheer, it was, you know, uh, and the media doesn't help us either. I, I'm not a media basher like many of my compatriots are. I've worked in the media, I've been the media. Um, but I do know there's a certain bias. Um, I've written about it before that uh, there is a higher standard conservatives are held to. And that is, I think, what happened to, to Andrew Shear too, and to an extent to Aaron O'Toole. But it's also, you know, conservatives eat their own as well. I mean, look, th these guys were, what happened to Aaron O'Toole was really no mercy, right? It, it was just, you're, you're out. And um, I think that, uh, that that aggressiveness that you see is also it's a problem because it looks mean to people outside the party and they're like wow you do that I'm like that's conservatives are not nice right nice well liberals aren't that nice either no it, it, you don't expect them to be <laughs> that's the difference you kind of have this idea that the liberals are going to be mean because we always the liberals always turf their leader after a certain amount of time and install someone else conservatives just do it so blatantly behind everyone's back and you go well, what just happened there so that's just an yeah. outsider's perspective on that i i want to i want to turn and thank you for answering that question because it's always bothered me that conservatives are <laughs> held to a higher standard even though we're the same people we all bleed red when we get poked so i want to turn back to those three types of conservatives that we need to uh, you need to win over to form a government to win and we saw that more prevalent uh, the next group more prevalent than we have ever in the last uh, 2021 election and that is the rural urban divide um yeah. conservatives uh if you look at a map you can pick up probably every single Go rural riding and not win because land doesn't vote people vote uh while the conservatives <laughs> did win them more votes it doesn't matter if you only win them in a large portion in certain ridings how did the conservatives win back urban voters and that is the big question because unless you want to take government you need to win montreal you need to win toronto downtown lower mainland bc they they lost seats the conservatives in the last election how do you win them back well i'm going to scare you it's not just the last election it's been happening since stephen baker and happening since the 60s there's research really? that I came across that shows, yep there's been an increased the liberals every election have done better in urban ridings per se um they have increased their their share of the urban riding and it's not even the ndp it's not the ndp that wins either you know people think of the ndp as the urban no it's actually the liberals they have consolidated more after more and part of it builds on layers right there's the issue of new canadians and where they settle that is one big thing so when you get the new canadian vote it transmutes into the urban vote there's a huge overlap of the two um you know we have 400,000 people coming every year where do they go well you know they're not they're not going out uh they're, they're not going even to red deer or lethbridge they're going to calgary right they're going to edmonton that's that's where they go yeah. so bigger urban centers have become more and more red um the issue, though, too, is the type what happens to people when they get into cities, um, they are exposed to other points of view, they are, it, it becomes the sort of cosmopolitan, I guess it's been called the creative class, it's been called a laptop class, it's been called, you know, your mindset changes when you're not in a urban or rural setting. And the type of people who move to, to from rural to urban also are perhaps looking for that environment, looking for a more uh, accepting in some cases, or uh, you know, different frame of mind. So issues that like abortion, for example, is an urban issue it might sound weird, but it is actually, um, you know, Harper closed the door on that one. And I'm in the book, I'm very clear. I'm like, you can't open that door. That door has to stay closed. I know social conservatives will not want to hear this, but it has to stay closed if you want to win urban and Quebec, as you mentioned, it is just a no go. Um, so you leave that piece out. It doesn't mean you don't do things that matter to social conservatives um, and to faith-based conservatives, you, you find other things that and common ground, but that one's got to you know stay closed. Um, gun control was a big issue the last election, and this is an interesting thing because, to me, one of the principles of conservatism, and it is actually if you go back again to 1789 and you know and throughout history, is local government. Local trumps big government, trumps higher levels. The idea is government closest to the people. It's very grassroots, and. I think conservatives should embrace that. Um, it's not simply about decentralization from the federal to the provincial governments. No, you know what? On the issues of gun control, there are very different views in rural parts of the country and urban parts because their lived reality is so different. Well, why don't you have local decides? Um, this is something that to me makes eminent sense. 
because the kinds of weapons you would need or want to have in different parts of the, of the of the of a province they vary depending where you use them for and where you are and the threat and if you look at an urban agglomeration you're going to get people who are terrified of gun violence in their neighborhood because they see it but it's a totally different kind of use of firearms than it is if you're a hunter um so like this is the kind of thing that to me local is important um conservatives should emphasize that and say we're flexible we're not dogmatic we're not ideological we're not rigid in that sense our ideology is actually that people should the little platoons should decide the best and the le least interference from the top down possible so there's ways of attracting urban voters i mean the big thing too is affordability like that right now i mean that is the issue right if you can't you can't live in the city you grew up in you can't buy a house there you can't do all these things that is i think the first order of business so economic revitalization for cities economic prospects making sure that it's livable and affordable that is the biggest thing on everyone's plate and i think that's going to be the big issue for the next election to be honest i, I want to expand the urban versus rural divide and i want to talk about the canadian divide because if you go talk to a conservative in uh pei they're going to tell you what conservatives means to them if you go transplant that into Alberta, it's going to be something completely different. If you do it in Lower Man Lane, BC, it's going to be completely different. To win, the Liberals have always often been known as the big tent party. They welcome everyone until just recently with uh, Justin Trudeau. It seems like it's a little bit of a smaller big tent, but it's still a tent. <laughs> Do the Conservatives need to take a page out of the Liberals playbook and turn their party into not just a one issue party and be it a big issue party and big tent party where the people in PEI would feel comfortable in a party with the people in Alberta? Well, yes, and I think that goes to showing them a common thread. And in the book, I talk about the common threads and again, the opportunity piece is the common thread because that's what all the different groups all the different parts of the country they want the they want opportunity for themselves economically or culturally in the case of quebec we want the opportunity to be able to live our lives in french um and uh, pass that on to our kids um in uh pei you want the opportunity to preserve your way of life because it is very different from the way of life in alberta or the way of life in downtown toronto where i'm sitting right now um, you want to keep that culture, you want to keep that those touchstones and conservatism is very much about those kinds of intangible things. It's not simply about, it's certainly not about wealth transfers, which is the liberals, frankly, and this is really interesting research I came across in, in writing the book, that Justin Trudeau used the concept of wealth transfer to basically make government your friend, right? That was, and Bill Morneau even said it after I'd written it down, I'm like, he's using my, my language, he's stealing my thunder, but this is exact, he's right. The research bears this out that the liberal ethos is government's your friend. We are going to transfer, um, like Christopher Freeland wrote in her book, even before she got elected, from the wealthier class or the business class, we're going to transfer to the middle class, make their lives so much better. Well, you know what that actually did? The irony is that in the United States, yeah, the middle class was in trouble um, when uh, Trudeau in the, in the 2000s, early 2010s, rather, after the financial crisis. They were actually losing ground. Canada's middle class was not. We were not. Trudeau comes in. And he starts this whole, let's borrow, let's get deficits, let's transfer money to the middle class. The middle class is actually worse off now because why? They were disincentivized from working. Believe it or not, um, two income families had supports they didn't have before and the second income owner chose to work less. The result is they actually pulled in less money at the end of the day. Maybe that was a choice they liked, I don't know, but to say they economically favored them, absolutely untrue. So. The, the government's actually impoverished us with this theory that, you know, we just move money around. It's like a zero sum game. Conservatives aren't about that. The conservatives will say to the PEI, to the Alberta, to the Quebec, they'll say, you know what? We want you to be able to raise yourself up. We want equality of opportunity. That's really what people want. They want social mobility. Populism takes hold when people have no hope. When there's no social mobility, they think I get a job, I get the degree, I get do everything and I still can't get ahead. And then they're told, some people will tell them, it's because there's people in your way. That's the gatekeeper's argument. Other people will say, no, no, it's because those people have the money and that's a left woke argument. We're gonna give the money to you and take it from those people. So you get this populism versus wokeism and it, neither of them is the answer. It's really, government has a role. It does have a role to give everyone a level playing field, decent healthcare education, which right now is say a mess, especially the healthcare piece. 
we need to, to look at that. But the government has like a, to provide a certain baseline for people to then use to, to succeed and have that equal chance. Because people have an equal chance, then they're not populist. They, they don't look at that. They're like, okay, things are fair. But if things aren't fair, that's when people get angry. And it, it, it's very frustrating to see this, this conversation because nobody's really talking about that piece of what the conservatives could do is say equality of opportunity, which is a very conservative concept. So that's, I think, what they should focus on for all the areas of the country. Figure out what the opportunity you want and how do we as the conservatives help you get that. You've mentioned the word populism a little bit uh, throughout the interview so far, and I want to jump on that for a few seconds because I, I'm I'm here in Calgary, Alberta, and um, there has been the rise of the People's Party of Canada with Maxine Bernier's uh, party across this province, uh, this province and this country. But there's also been the rise of the Maverick Party, West Canada's Western yep. J former J Hill, uh, former government whip J Hill, I should say. Um, both have been on my show, and we've talked about how the Conservatives have forgotten Alberta because they come in, they get elected, they go off to Ottawa. And and when leaders like uh, Andrew Shearer or Aaron O'Toole, they won't come to Alberta because what happens is they know to win a government, you have to win in Toronto. You need to win in Montreal. So Alberta always gets forgotten. And then there's a rise in the rift of the Conservative Party where people are saying, OK, if the Conservative Party won't stand for what I want to stand for, I'm going to go to Maxime Bernier because he's actually talking about my issues that I want to talk about. Is the Conservative Party forgetting our its Western cousins and where the Western Party, Western uh, Canadians stand right now? Because the the rise is here. People are going away from the Conservative Party. It may not be right now because there's a leadership race and they want to jockey towards their candidate. But I spoke to the leader of the Maverick Party. They're seeing former Conservatives come to their party because they are sick and tired of Conservatives not addressing Western issues anymore. See, the irony for that is I'll tell you is that Eastern conservatives, such as I am, that the perspective every year is that the party is run by the West. The federal party has been taken over by the West. And, you know, and you look at, statistically, it's interesting when you look at the original where Harper won over Belinda Stronach and you look at the percentage of votes he got, it looked like it was a relatively even marriage between the PC party, progressive conservatives and the reform alliance, whatever they were called, you know, at that point. But actually it wasn't because there was a point system in the party, just like there is now for this leadership. When you look at it, it was actually two thirds reform alliance, one third progressive conservatives. So the, the shift, the balance of power within the party had shifted significantly. Whether that was expressed in policy is another issue, but the feeling within the party, the feeling out East is that this is all about the West, it's Western concerns. Um, you know, support for the convoy, for example, uh, there's less support out East than there was out West. Um, support for some of the policies that the, that the conservatives have. You see, uh, you know, a carbon tax, for example. I mean, Quebec has a car had a carbon tax for years. Um, the West didn't want nothing to do with it. So you have on specific policy dynamics, you have a very different view on those things. And in the party, the sense is, okay, well, a majority vote is on that side. So, and, and the West, you know, maybe folks listening to this now, but I don't want to hear it, but that's the perception. So I think what the reality is though, is that there's a lot of anger because the West doesn't feel heard. It feels, and I think this is the thing, I think the sense is like, look, you know, we've taken the, we took the party to power for nine years under Stephen Harper. Um, built this, this coalition, this tent, and yeah, Trudeau tore it apart. But ever since then, um, you know, we feel like our, our stuff, we're being told that our views are wrong. And you're being told that by Trudeau more than I think within your own party, but the sense of, you know, demonizing the oil industry and the environmentalists and everyone piling on and saying how you know, bad the Western, like, it's terrible. I'd be annoyed too. And that I think is the real anger, but it's transmuted. And so of course, if I were a Western conservative and I look at what's happening in Ottawa right now, I'd be like, this government does not get us. Didn't get you know the convoy too. People went there because they were mad. And I interviewed lots of people who went to the convoy. I did not go myself, but I talked to them. It's like, why'd you go? What was the reason? It's like, well, no one's listening. Trudeau's not listening. They didn't say the conservatives weren't listening, right? But even if the conservatives listen, they're not in power. What are they gonna do? Yeah. 
So <laughs> I think that's the frustration, right? What do they? What can you do if you're not in power? You can't do anything. So that's the problem. How do you get to power and bring these concerns forward? Because that's the thing. Because if you look at the mass, you're right. You got to win in the GTA. And the GTA is not in favor of the convoy. I will tell you, they did not like it. So how do you appeal to those people and say, our concerns matter, but we want to get into power. So we need your votes. How do we do that? So I talk about that in the book. That's one of the, 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 the circles we have to square. It's finding that common ground and saying, okay, everyone has got to take a big picture view. How do you get to power? And then what do you do with it to make sure that people out West don't feel like they're being just, you know, used to, to do that? Yeah. I, I want to go back to the third area that needs the concern. This is the great thing. We start on topics, we go on a rant, and that's where we come I back. I can talk forever. I'm sorry. I keep taking you away from your topics, Chris. Like, <laughs> no, this is the great thing. I, I, mean, I have I, a lot to say. I've been read. This book is like, it's literally it's 10 chapters long, plus the intro and the conclusions. So there's like a lot of a lot of weight in there too. So it's, I, it's not, it's not a light read, but it's not a heavy read, but it's not, you know, I, I did a lot of things. <laughs> I've always told my guests who ever come on before we start and I didn't do it with you, but I'll do it. And all my uh, listeners know that um, I like these type of conversations. It feels like we're just having a conversation between two friends about topics that are here. And yes, yeah. you're pitching a book, but I'm happy to do that as well. Um, I want to talk about the conservatives problem with youth. It yeah. seems like youth go to, let's be honest, uh, the NDP or the liberals now, because the NDP are kind of in a weird moment of time where they're more liberal than NDP and the NDP or, or the liberals are more NDP than liberal. But here we are. Um, how do the conservatives win over youth voters, the millennial voters, the 18? Because we saw in the last election, even in the Ontario election, which you're from Ontario, you should know. Youth don't vote. They don't get out to vote. They don't have a need to get out and vote. They don't see a reason to get out and vote. How do the conservatives motivate youth and millennials and Gen Zs to get out and actually cast a ballot for their for the conservative party? Okay, I'm gonna say something heretical. You don't want all of them to vote, so not all going to vote for you. <laughs> so no. Um, you want to motivate your voters as with any cohort. It's false to say, oh, we just want to motivate young people to Trudeau won because young people voted for him. All right. And the more young people participate without the conservatives getting their young people out, it actually works against the Tories. So you have to look at your voters within that, as all the parties do, right? Um, there's a beautiful study by Deloitte that cuts people up at slices and dices into different types of groups. And it's kind of like the, the Conservative Party did that itself in the elections in 2005 um, and uh, 2006, rather, 2008 and 2011. But the Deloitte study is very interesting because what it shows is that, first of all, there are two subgroups. There's Gen Z and there's millennials, and they are different. They are very different. Gen Z is right now, the only voters in Gen Z are the 18 to 24 year olds. They're the only eligible ones, right? The rest are coming up the pipe. They are going to be the biggest generation, though, by 2036. They are going to be bigger than the boomers and bigger than the millennials. They are the ones that really matter. The good news is, within that, there are 49% of them that are accessible to conservatives based on their typology. They are right-leaning. They are striving. They are, a lot of them, new Canadian second-generation kids. They are interested in um, conservative ideas. They lean right. They don't like woke culture. They are very, actually, they've been very turned off at university, many of them. So you've got a big accessible group for conservatives within Gen Z. The problem is, like you said, there's not enough of them right now to make a difference. 18 to 24 plus motivating anyone to vote at that age is, is hard. So it's that's to me like the 10 year project. The, the immediate project, though, is the millennials. And there you have hmm, only 20 percent that are predisposed to voting conservative. There is another 20 percent that can vote conservative within their co of cohort. Um, within that group, though, there is partly, uh, there's, very, there's a group that's very much uh, pro-religion, pro-faith. Um, they're also environmentalist. So, which explains why, if you don't have an environmental policy, you're not going to get those, those young people. They're not even that young. They're close. They're the 35-year-old. They're the top millennials, the, the oldest ones. But they are, there's a group in there that's accessible if you have an environmental policy that makes sense to them. Um, you also have Within that, you have other groups that are just turned off politics completely. I have a feeling some of those folks might be turned on by the convoy because they look at that and say, government is not, you know, government, I feel very alienated from it. And I feel even more alienated now with the pandemic. And I think you're seeing that in both Gen Z and millennials, because when I talk to people, the only generation or only group really that with which the convoy slash, you know, the rhetoric that Pierre Polyev has on freedom really resonated was that group. 
certainly um, it was disproportionate and young people I talked to, my own stepson is pro Pierre, right? Why? Because he sees him on uh, six Chan or six, whatever it's called, not six Chan, so it's six, six, the six or something is some, some YouTube thing in Toronto. I don't even know. Um, he, uh, he sees him on social media. Um, he likes what he has to say about freedom. It resonates with him, but it is not enough people. And this is, this is when you do the math, it's not enough to offset the older voters that are turned off by that stuff. This is the equation within the conservative party. Maybe not because I know this, I mean, the polling is different for how conservatives feel than the broader electorate. But if you want to win the broader electorate, you have to take these things into account. And you can look at this and go, okay, how do we find a balance? But for young people, they want opportunity too. They want, they want to feel that they do the right things. They will get ahead. They'll have a better life than their parents. That's what conservatives have to offer them. And also they have to listen. This is the thing, this generation, this is true of all of them. They're very much, I mean, not that they think they know everything, but they want to be heard, right? There are a lot at work. We know this. You hire a millennial and they want the corner office right away. You're like, why? But they think there's an entitlement factor. And this kind of sort of glosses over all of them are kind of, there's a bit of that. So you have to make them feel heard. Doesn't mean you'll do what they want. But you have to make them feel heard. Um, they're also very concerned about mental health. This is a big issue, big, 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 big issue, especially for the Gen Zs. Um, they really are struggling, many of them with mental health issues. And a party that cares about that, the caring piece that conservatives often are accused of not having, um, will go a long way with them. So that is another thing. Um, and the gig economy, that's the final piece that, you know, their lives are so scattered. Uh, they work three jobs. They don't feel secure. Um, having respect for workers in that environment, like Doug Ford did in Ontario, was brilliant. Um, you know, he finally came around with protections for workers and this kind of thing. And he got unions to support him. It was like, he really changed the channel. Federal conservatives have to do the same thing. And they have to look at that. The evolution of work has changed. The this is the we're going into the fourth election where the liberals are government or the fourth election where the conservatives are striving to get back into government. Uh, Stephen Harper was the first, then Andrew Shearer, then Aaron O'Toole. Uh, we talk about the right path and the Conservative Party of Canada right now is at a fork in the road. And now for transparency's sake, and I think you mentioned it earlier on, you are uh, an advisor to the Sheree campaign. You are working with the Sheree campaign. Is this a fork in the road that could determine the future if uh, of the Conservative Party if it's a viable option going forward? Or if the Conservatives don't win the next election and don't get it right, could we see the fall of the conservative government of conservative party, the once mighty conservative uh, party in Canada? Yes, I'd be very blunt about it because it's just <laughs> math. It's de it's demography. It's math, right? The groups I identify, um, you know, um, I have have some numbers here, but right now it's one in five Canadians are foreign born by twenty thirty six. Is one in, it's one in three. Um, the Liberals, like I said, have been gaining in urban areas consistently since the 1960s, and that is that is continued. If that continues, it again, the Conservatives will not win where they have to win. They will not under our current system of government, form government. And Millennials are going to be the dominant group by 2036, and then 2045, it's going to be Gen Z is going to actually be, um, they, they're going to outnumber the baby boomers and the Millennials by 2045. So you've got like this sort of 20-year window of which I say it's not, it's not even that long. It's like two elections, right? Because once people lose faith in you, it's kind of like a domino effect, right? If they really, if you lose too many times, they're like, eh, no. And you also lose your fundraising base. You lose all that stuff. Um, it's not like the United States where you've got two parties, right? This is the thing. Canada has a very different political culture. So for conservatives, it's always been an issue because we have split into populist conservative veins several times in our history and every time it allows liberals to be in power for two or three elections every single time and they get more entrenched each time so that is the danger is that the way our, our system is structured is that it favors the liberal party to the detriment of the others and the regional distribution favors the liberals as well because of the urban piece so for conservatives yeah it is it is a bit of a do or die um and yeah you mentioned it, i'm supporting josh Ray. i've known him since i was well not 14 but 16 i think i first met him when i was in the PC party. <laughs> Josh Ray, yes, yes, Josh Ray. And, you know, of course, I mean, my heart is with Jean and I believe he's the best leader. And I, you know, I don't go into that in the book. It's not about that. 
Um, but I also, the reason that I work on this campaign is because of what it represents. And had I run, I would have run on the same kind of things, which is that I think um, we need a party that's united. We need to unify the country. We need to find those common threads. And the po politics of anger is a dangerous road to go down because I don't, I don't feel that using that populist anger element, I believe addressing it, yes, 100%, you have to address it. But the way to address it is not to say that it's right and just leave it there is to say, you know what, here's the reason this is happening. Let's find a solution and tossing out, you know, tossing out the elites. I mean, you're demonizing the elites in your own party. Like, I hate to say it, but the conservative party, you take out all its elites, uh, especially in where I'm sitting here, you're not going to win a single election here. So what does that help you? It's cutting off your nose to spite your face. I mean, people have to make peace with each other and see each other's points of view and try and coexist. So, I mean, Jean has a history of doing that, which is why I'm supporting him in this. He's a uniter. Great. And I hope that that is the direction we go in. But if we do not, which, you know, people will decide, I hope that some of the direction that's offered in the book will at least inform whatever decisions are made to try and bring the groups together so they don't end up splitting. Because if they do, then I, you know, I don't think we win the next election at all. So. Last question before we wrap up is this. Do conservatives talk to each other? Because uh, we are seeing- We're talking. Well, you're not a conservative. You said well, <laughs> I, I'm a former progressive conservative, okay? I'm a former okay. progressive. I ran for the liberals. Don't hold that against me. Let's just leave that on the table right oh, there. Oh my God, I'm turning off right now. There okay. you go. Um, hey, uh, Justin, I, I have the pleasure of saying Justin Trudeau swore at me. So there's my claim to fame. Wow. Get that <laughs> um, on a t-shirt. Get it on a t-shirt. There please. you go. Um, totally. Do conservatives talk to each other? Because- uh, I, I, I come from, uh, as, as now aware, but I came from the Liberal Party, uh, Ontario Liberals. And even though we may disagree with each other, Liberals, they used to talk to each other. They might go out for a beer and have a sit down conversation. The polarization in this leadership race has been a spectacle in itself of watching the polarization, the anger, the uh, just back and forth between campaigns. At the end of this, can we unify the Conservative Party to win? Because every day this goes on, it seems like you're getting more divided, more anger, more frustration at different campaigns. And whoever wins is going to have a hard time unifying this party, aren't they? Um, yes, it is. And that's why you need you need a leader who's willing to do that and able to do that. Um, but beyond that, I think also um, it's incumbent on all, all the campaigns right now, campaigns that are engaging in this sort of, you know, tactics to like cool it and focus on policies and focus on the ideas. Um, and hopefully this next phase of the campaign will be like that. Uh, we will see. Um, but I think, yes, at the end of the day, um, we have to bring everyone into a tent and we have to find the commonalities and not not also let the liberals define the conservatives because they will see this is the thing is that there have been really nasty races before i mean clark mulrooney you go back to those days which people one people were 79 at, or 83 uh, <laughs> well both honestly like the leadership though like the first leadership where clark won i mean you know people sat and seethed in the background for years 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 you know and martin kretchen like I mean, come on, there's the liberals had their share of, of bad blood, you know, Taylor Swift starts singing uh, it really nasty. Um, so it's not this is not the only race like that. Uh, what's what I say is different this time is because it's not a social conservative, fiscal conservative, libertarian, like those traditional groups going, who's going to have the final say? It's a class divide within the party. That's the difficulty that has to be healed because you're demonizing each other. You're saying, I don't have anything in common with you. You're taking advantage of me. That's what the message is. If you're an elite, you're taking advantage of me. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, that's much harder. So we have to stop that. We have to get past that and say, you know what? We all need each other here. Rural needs the urban, needs the new Canadian, needs the, needs the elite. Because you know what? Can I say something? If you're a parent, you put your kids into hockey. You want them to be elite, don't you? Yeah. You want them to go to the NHL. You want your kid to get into a good college. You want your kid to bring home 100% on the math test. Why are we beating people up? Because they've done well. If their attitude is such that they're standing in your way, okay, but you're generalizing there and you're saying that. And, and, and I don't agree with that. I think that's not the issue right now in terms of why people can't get ahead. So don't do that. We should 
be happy. We should want our kids to be elite too someday. That's the aspirational. That's the opportunity piece. And you talk to new Canadians and I know this, my parents were new Canadians. Your program from day one, you are going to get a good job, get a degree. You do not let the family down, right? You're going to be an elite someday. Okay. So there's nothing wrong with aspiring to be an elite. Just like there's nothing wrong with saying, yeah, it's not my thing, but you don't demonize people. So we've got to have that. We've got to have a beer. Exactly. Chris, everyone's got to get together at Stampede and have a beer. And just yes. chill. I'm looking, I'm looking I forward to it because I am you, doing, I am looking forward to that too. You are here, as I said at the beginning of the interview, yes. Jan, July 7th. I was going to say January again, July there 7th at the Petroleum Club from 11.45 to 1.30. Uh, $45 are the tickets. Uh, they can be purchased at opbooks.com. The links will be in the show notes. So literally just scroll down in the show notes. If you're watching this on YouTube, scroll down. If you're watching this on uh if you're listening to this in your car, please pull over before using your phone or go home and then get, buy your tickets later. Um, so with the $45, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, Tasha, you get a copy of the book and you get it signed, signed by the I, author. I will sign it. I will write your name in it. I will do that for you. Uh, and you get a lunch. And yes, you get a lot. Look. Book a book launch reading and question and answer. So if there's any questions that we did not cover in the last 45 minutes, 50 minutes that you want Tasha to answer, please get your tickets today because it's a highly, I, even the 45 minutes, we've had a great conversation. Um, Tasha, thank you so much for doing this. This has been an honor and a pleasure. Oh, well, thank you so much, Chris. And the hashtag is the right path book. Easiest there way to find it. The right path book. There, there you, go. you go. So if you're on social media, go do that as well. Um, uh, I want to thank Tasha for sitting down with us today. It's been an honor and a pleasure. And as I say to this, I say to my listeners every single time, as I just told them to go to social media and hashtag, get up from behind social media from time to time and go have a conversation with somebody because it actually does make our society better. It makes our democracy better. And sometimes yelling into the void of Twitter does not do any good for anyone. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, guys, keep talking.